So good morning. I'm. Uh, it's nice to see you. Uh, I appreciate the uh, accommodation to uh, allow me to come in with my friend Judge Edwards, his wife Stacy. The travel story. I think I should let them tell you. But uh, the the uh, thumbnail sketch is they were supposed to fly into Burlington on Sunday, wound up with the planes canceled into Burlington Sunday and Monday. They flew, we were exchanging email early Sunday morning. I got an email, I think it was from Stacy at 12.30 in the morning, our time. And they had just heard that the flights were canceled. And we, were, we started immediately talking about rescheduling. The, the judge and I have been talking about him coming here for MLK Day. He's speaking at the law school this afternoon for a couple of years now. Um, and I won't go on, I'm gonna, but I want you to know, our relationship goes back a few years. Uh, uh, Jimmy, uh, uh, when he was a judge, started a, this very unique school that I think you all have seen in the materials that I sent over, uh, called the um, Innovative Concept School. It's, a, it's a, the only school of its kind in the United States. Uh, received, this is the first time we met, was about four or five years ago, when uh, the judge received a, an award in Washington at the U.S. Supreme Court that is, uh, that is delivered annually by the Chief Justice John Roberts called the William H. Rehnquist Award. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an award that's given to a celebrated state court judge. No federal judges are included. This is only for state court judges who have, uh, who, who have done outstanding things as Judge Edwards. We have been talking as members, common members of the board of directors of the National Center for a, a few years about him coming for MLK. So I am just absolutely thrilled. I am humbled by your uh, tenacity <laughs> to come here. And so uh, let me stop talking and I'll introduce uh, the judge to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative. It, uh, uh, Chief Justice Reiber, uh, uh, when he introduces me, I, I start to feel really, really small. Uh, because I know that uh, it's very difficult to live up uh, to people's perceptions about you. But I am just very honored and just uh, overwhelmed with gratitude uh, to have the opportunity to, to visit and to especially have the opportunity to talk to the law students uh, at uh, Vermont Law School. Uh, so I'm very, very excited to, to do that. Um, I sit on the bench for 25 years uh, in the city of St. Louis uh, with all of its issues and all of its problems. Um, problems uh, uh, that uh, include inequities, uh, 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 race and gender, uh, to fairness for children, and all of the family issues that exist uh, in, any, in any big uh, state. Uh, I'm from St. Louis, born and raised uh, in the city of St. Louis. Every single thing that I remember, every single thing that was ever given to me was uh, from the generosity of strangers. I grew up uh, in a public housing complex, so therein was public housing. Food stamps, public education, single mom, four siblings who taught us that the most important thing that I could ever do was to get an education. The first time that I ever slept on a mattress, I was six years old, and a friend of my mom gave us a mattress to get us off the floor. And so it's from there that I believe that my sense of duty, doing for others, the most important thing that anyone can ever do. And so when I got an opportunity to sit on the bench, and I was appointed by a friend of mine that I had met early on who was just very kind to me, a young man by the name of John Ashcroft, who became a United States Senator, and then thereafter became a United States Attorney General. And John and I still have an opportunity to chat, and I have an opportunity to talk. He put me on a bench knowing that I was the most liberal person he had ever met in his life. But he put me on the bench, notwithstanding all of that. And we talk, and we don't necessarily agree all the time about all of the legal issues, but we're friends. And that's what matters to me. 
And so after 25 years, following the Mike Brown case in 2014 in the city of St. Louis that made our state iconic for all of the wrong reasons, and after the Ferguson riots, and after the Jason Stockley case, where a white police officer shot and killed an unarmed black man in the city of St. Louis, and where protests was happening in our city every single day. You see, Ferguson is about two minutes from St. Louis City. And so uh, we're sitting in a county where all of these areas are contiguous to each other. And so after all of those things, and daily protests, and destruction of private property, and, and arrest, and distrust of police officers, dysfunctionality at its highest, because our officers had stopped policing, because they no longer wanted to be vilified. We had the national media all over the place in our small city. It exposed us, but it made us better. It was, I believe, the genesis of the Black Lives Matter movement, movements all over this country. Some would argue that all lives matter. But it gave us an opportunity, I believe, to be on the cutting edge of changing the world, certainly changing the U.S. Because remember, it was in 1857 that Dred Scott was in the city of St. Louis. It was in, 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 in 1947 that, that Shelley V. Kramer, it restri with restrictive covenants, came out of the city of St. Louis. I believe in 2014 and 2015 and 2016 and 17, 18, and 19, it will be where St. Louis will again become a leader on doing the right thing. So when the mayor asked me if I would consider being the public safety director for the city of St. Louis, it was from that backdrop that I had to consider all of that. It was, it was obfuscation. It was bad. 25 years on the bench, I'm the most senior judge. I'm probably the most popular judge in the state of Missouri. Why should I? I take this responsibility on in the city. Well, I started to think about what I was taught when I was a child, which is generosity of others. What can I do to make somebody else's life better? And that was more important to me than my own self-worth, my value. See, my wife understood that early on. She knew that we would never, ever be wealthy because everything that I ever got, I gave it away. She, she understood that. And she understood that when, and then I was a young lawyer at AT&T on a fast track. And when they asked me to take over the South African telephone company, and I made a decision that I wanted to stay in St. Louis. You know, she didn't like that very much. Uh, but she understood that it was more important to me to be at home and to save the lives of the people that I could touch uh, than to be too concerned about my own. And so I took the job as public safety director in the city of St. Louis because I needed to stop that protesting. I needed to stop the property damage. I needed to, to, to stand in the middle of police distrust in the community. I need to fix our city. And so I took the job. And I met with protesters. And I met with police. And I hired a police chief. I talked to my fire department. I talked to my building department. I have nine departments that I'm responsible for. The jails, the police, the fire, building, excise, oversight, paramedics, EMS. I have 4,000 employees. I have about a billion dollar budget. And I have the responsibility to equalize life chances for everybody in our city, irrespective of who they are or where they come from. And so I believe that is my job as that one person standing in the gap to change the culture, to engage our community and to always try to do the right thing. And I can tell you that we're moving a needle. 
in a very positive way. So I'm very happy about that. But my first love is always education. Certainly it is the key to all of life's rewards. It's a key to a stable paycheck. We all want that. But with education comes the opportunity, I believe, to change a person's life and to help our community. And so it gives me a great honor to know what you're doing and all the work that is happening here in Vermont. I know what's going on in Vermont. I knew I was coming to Vermont. So like any decent and responsible lawyer, I researched everybody here. <laughs> I knew what I was walking into. I understand what happened last year with the African American legislature. I know all of those things. Yet, I believe that we have to be present, that you have to be at the table if you're going to change the minds and the hearts of people. You see, we're in all, all of us, we're in this together. We all are in this together. And so I come here to deliver the Martin Luther King speech. And I come here because I was invited by a friend, by Justice Reimer. I come here because we've developed a wonderful relationship, a respectful relationship. I come here because in my heart, I believe that he thinks that what I have to say matters. And so when we look at all of the things that I've tried to do, I've tried to be an example. It's easy to have a conversation, but I've tried to be an example. And I had a chance to do that and to, and to share our, our message, not only with you, but with Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. You would think that Justice Roberts being appointed by a Republican, being very, very conservative, and, and having these legal ideologies that he would be so far to the right. That, that he didn't get the human side of it. But when I received the Rehnquist Award, which is the highest judicial award in our country, it was Justice Roberts who said, you know what, I kind of like this guy from the Midwest. I kind of like what he's trying to do. And so I'm in a very small footprint, and I know that. Maybe we'll change the world from that small footprint, just like Dred Scott, just like Shelley V. Kramer, just like Plessy versus Ferguson, Plessy versus Ferguson, just like all of those wonderful cases that you guys are here making laws in Vermont. You know, Justice Riber showed me the, the wonderful mirror on the wall when I walked through here and the battle. Cedar Creek battle, yeah. And I looked at it, and immediately, you know, it, it, just, it just takes us all the way back. Those of you probably walk by that mirror every day and never look at it. But I looked at that mirror just for a split second, and I started to wonder about all the bloodshed on that day, in that battle, for you to be here, for me to be here. It's just an amazing thing when you in, internalize that type of stuff. It has great value. It has wonderful historical value. Just look how far we've come. Women in the State House. Three women on the Vermont Supreme Court. An African American having a conversation at this table with you and just reflect back. For some of us, it's, it's a long reflection back. <laughs> just reflect back. Could this have happened 50 years ago or 75 years ago? 
or a hundred years ago. We're making progress. We're making wonderful, wonderful progress. And we have to stay the course. It was Dr. King that said that in order for us to achieve, we have to do it together. Or we'll perish together as fools. And that's really what it's all about. So thank you for looking at my TED Talk. I appreciate it. Hopefully you had an opportunity, any of you, to look at For Akeem, yeah. which is a little different. Uh, uh, you don't have the, the, the big population of marginalized <laughs> and African Americans, you know, that are suffering uh, in school, fighting every day to be relevant, fighting every day. To accomplish something and so it makes me smile when I think about those children because I think about my own siblings and my own situation I think about the fact that I was there I think about the fact that I know that there's no measurable difference between them right now today and me when I was a child and I think about that housing complex, that emphasis, poor Igo housing complex that was even segregated, that we had to implode because we were stacking people on top of each other. The fact that my mother struggled there in an apartment, five people no bigger than this room, that we struggled there. And so when I had a chance to, to establish my school, I established it right across the street from that building now, because it reminds me every day of my obligation. It reminds me every day of my duty to give back. So my whole life is about what can I do to help? That's the question. It's never ever about the degrees that we have on our walls. It's not about that. It's not about how much money we have in our bank accounts because the only person that cares about that is your kids. <laughs> it's not about that. It's never about what's written on our tombstone. It's not about that. It's about what did you do to help somebody else and did you instill in them the right energy that you instill in them that desire for them to help somebody else. I think those of us that are intellectual, we just call it cascading mentoring. But that's what it's really called. So I'll, I, I am honored, I'm so honored to have this opportunity to come here, to talk to you, to share with you a little bit about me. And so if there are any, any thoughts, uh, uh, I, I, uh, I was one of those judges that always gave the lawyers the last word uh, and uh, always uh, listen very attentively and carefully because I was one of those judges that was not afraid to change my ruling because, you know, your minds are I'm much better than mine. I see these young legislatures here, and I'm just, I'm just amazed. I'm just, I'm just real pleased and, and very, very proud uh, that you guys can be my children. I'm proud of that. Proud that you're here and proud that you're carrying on. And I'm proud that you would allow me to come in here and visit. So, uh, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. I am. Hard for me to express my gratitude and, and just um, how you really have showed us the importance of our common, our common humanity. And those are words from a Vermont Supreme Court case that I'm sure you've heard, um, read in our Constitution, but really it is so important to celebrate our common humanity. And, and that really they are all our children. As I was watching the, the trailer and listening to you, they really are all our children. And um, and so I thank you for reminding us to lead from our heart and, have, 
and how important that is. And I'm so appreciative to the to the Chief Justice. And um, I have a 14 year old son in in ninth grade, and they're currently studying in global studies revolutions and uh, leaders. And uh, I'm going to suggest that they watch watch them. It's very kind of you. Thank um, you. Learn about your school and. Um, and those ties, right? The, I mean, I just love that, the empowerment of, of how those you know, students, those, those young men felt listened to and respected and how, and how you had the vision to just take all of that and, and give these kids a chance. And so I'm, I'm That's grateful. That's very, very kind. Thank you. I'm Thank so you grateful. for the invitation. Thank you. So I'll just open it up to... Yeah. Thank you. I will try to echo what um, our chairwoman has said, but I share those views, and I really enjoyed watching all of the trailers and links, too. And the one thing that really struck me is how many spheres you've been active in, with the school, and with the role in municipal governance, and then the role in the judiciary. And as someone who's not a lawyer, who's sitting on my second term here, I wonder, I know it's a big question, but those three different spheres, how do you see them as working together at the end of the day when you reflect back on what you did in each one? What do you come away with? I believe that the common denominator in, in what we all do should be love. That's the, that's the common denominator. And so where I come from, unfortunately, we have to teach people to love. I don't believe that, that we are innately born that we, we know how to respect one another or that we know how to, to love. And one of the, the programs that I have at my school <clears throat> is a stray dog training program. You might ask yourself, why a stray dog training program? What is so significant about that? Well, I know that from where I come from, you know, nobody really taught me how to be a dad or taught me how to love another African-American man in an appropriate setting. And so I knew that a lot of my kids, they didn't know what love felt like from their parent, from their community, from their family. So I had to teach them how to love. And what better way to teach an individual how to love than to find something that they can identify <coughs> with. A stray dog. A stray dog left on the street to fend for itself. A stray dog being kicked out, nobody cares about them. A stray dog. And you put that stray dog in that environment and you bring that child who's been kicked out, who's been harmed or hurt, and you put them together, and before you know it, the kid is loving on that dog. And that dog is returning unconditional love to that child not cursing the child to get up in the morning to get out of the house, not yelling or screaming at the child. And the child, in return, is stroking the dog and holding the dog close. And before you know it, the child has learned how to love another living thing and be receptive to another living thing loving him or loving her. And so when we look at all of the things, everything that I've ever done has been to say, listen, we have to find a way to love each other. We have to find a way to live together. Our life, irrespective of how young you are and you never think about death, irrespective of you think that you're gonna live forever, none of us will. And so in this very short period of time, what did we do? What did we do to make the world better? See, you can't be angry every day. You can't go to work angry every day. 
Some days you have to smile. And some days you have to take risks. And some days you have to reach across the aisle and say, you know what? It makes sense. Some days it doesn't matter whether you are a Republican or whether you are a Democrat, whether you are a lesbian, whether you are a gay male, whether you are black or whether you white, someday it won't matter. If you land in that emergency room and somebody that you love the most is dying, you don't care. You can care less. If the surgeon is black, only thing you care about is if he's competent. You don't care whether the surgeon is a lesbian or whether gay or even whether the surgeon is Muslim. You don't care. Only thing that you care about is somebody saving this person that I love the most, saving their life. And so if we can get past all of the those things that are only constructs anyway, if we can get past all of that, can you imagine what a great life we would have? Can you imagine coming to the Vermont house and having a party every day and not having to argue or not having to dig in? Can you just imagine coming here and everybody able to listen respectfully, able to talk things out? and able to arrive at solutions that make sense for the betterment of our state. Can you just imagine that? What a great day, or what great days we would have. And so in my mind, it's really about love. It's not about all the other things that don't matter. It's what's in our heart. It's what's in our heart that matters most to me. But I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. Well, I, I don't have a specific question, but I just wanted to thank you for coming here. A lot of what you're saying resonates with me. And I, I wish there was a way you could deliver this conversation to every single committee mm -hmm. in this building and to the entire legislative body. So I, I just want to say thank you very, very much thank for coming. You. Thank you, Representative. You know, I look at you and look like, you know, my oldest is 42. You're, you're not 42 yet. <laughs> not, not yet. And I look at you guys, I'm like, you know what? You can be my kid. And I appreciate you guys. You have no idea. I appreciate it. I don't know what your political affiliation is, but at the end of the day, you hurt me. And maybe you go back home and you reflect on something that I said. Just maybe. Your, your comments are so timely for many, many reasons. Uh, one of the things that we're doing on Thursday is we're having a, uh, a hearing on fair and impartial policing, which is a uh, topic of, of conversation um, here in, in Vermont for many of the leaders in the room and for others. and. Um, and we don't have a, there's not a piece of legislation, there's no, you know, any, but more really just a conversation to have. And I've tried to include the help of many of the committee members and coach and also taking leadership, but really having voices come to the table and, um, <coughs> and listen, and then hopefully together, public safety, law enforcement, um, advocates, um, we can really move the conversation forward and, and work together and because right now it's being played out in the press and you know all things like that and um, so it's all I, over the country you yeah. know we, we yeah. have to we have to um, we have to acknowledge uh, that we do have some issues in, in policing I acknowledge it every day um, um, we're trying to engage some culture changes for my police officers who were indicted uh, just last month, um, I spent a lot of time with uh, uh, Attorney General Sessions, which is a civil rights type case, just making sure that, that uh, we don't have pattern and practice issues, uh, that uh, we're just looking at these officers and, and asking them to, to change the culture. I mean, we have culture issues all over this country.
And so uh, I want you to de-escalate as opposed to escalate. I want you to get home every day. I want your life to be important and valued. So you have to get home every day. But I make it very clear to my officers, if you go out there, I know you're brave and I know you're tough. We expect for you to protect and serve. But at the same time, I want you to go home. So if you go out there and you kill somebody and it's justifiable, you don't have to worry about where I'll be. I'm going to send you home and I'll stand in front of the media and I'll answer the questions. But if you kill somebody and it wasn't justifiable, you don't have to worry about where I'll be. I'll be sitting with the FBI because we're going to indict you. But I can say that to them because for 25 years I worked with them. I didn't have to establish a reputation or credibility with the officers. And so when I walk in the room and I say we have to have equitable policing irrespective of the community and who's in a particular community, equitable policing is the most important thing that you can do. <coughs> so if you're engaging in implicit bias, then fix it because we all have it. So fix it. But if you're a racist, then you need to let me know so I can write you a recommendation for another job. We can't have that. Equitable policing, understanding that we have to treat people fairly, understanding that your community is a little different than mine. But when a police officer encounters an African American kid, boy, with dreadlocks and pants down, it doesn't give you license to kill. No African American mom should ever have to ask me the question. Judge, when my boy encounters the police, will he always go to jail or will he die? Those are questions that I want, don't want to hear anymore. I can't have that in our community. And so when I say we're moving the needle a little bit, we are. In 2017, there were 28 police-involved shootings in the city of St. Louis with 14 dead. Last year, I had six police-involved shootings last year with one dead. One is too many, but it's a hell of a lot better than 18 or 19 or 20 or 24. So we're working. We understand. And so, I don't envy the position that you're in. I know it's tough. I know it's tough. And every community is different. And I pray that God gives you the to will to do the right thing, always. And the confidence that what you do will make a difference. That's my prayer for you. Open up to anybody in the room. I just have one yeah. question, sir. Uh, when it comes to changing the culture on the base level of for any police department, whether it's in the break room or wherever it is, how do you? What recommendations do you have? What advice do you have on how to slowly shift that culture towards equitable policing, as you described? Well, I think it starts from the top. And then it starts in the academy. You know? So when we are teaching, when our academy teachers, oftentimes around the country, they're police officers themselves. And so when a police officer teaches another police, they're teaching what they know. And oftentimes what they know is the culture that was instilled and ingrained in it. It doesn't matter whether they're black, white, Indian, it doesn't matter. What they're teaching is what they know. And so one of the ways that we're trying to change the culture in the city of St. Louis is to go to the law school and get the professors from the law school to teach constitutional law, to teach First Amendment, to teach equal protection, to teach due process, so that they're getting a different approach to those types of things that are so important in policing. 
we still need the the expert shooters. We still need them to be able to, to protect themselves on the street. We still need all of that. But to change the mindset and to change the culture is to change the education. And so we do that by enlisting the support of the law schools. And we do that by looking outside of police, training the police in those critical areas of First Amendment and fairness and due process. We bring in, we bring in mental health professionals because our officers are strong and they're brave and no one wants to admit, you know, I was at a scene today and I was tough, but when I went home, I balled up in the field position and I cried. See, that officer can't have that conversation with, with his or her peers because it makes them look weak. Why do I want to ride in a car with an officer that cries? But they go home and they cry. And then they beat the crap out of their, their partner. And they yell at their kids. And they, they do all of those things. We have problems with domestic violence in our police departments all over this country. We have problems with mental health with police departments all over this country. But that facade, they have to they have to be strong. And so we have to look at the mental health issue. It doesn't mean that they should be terminated. It means that it should be fixed. We have to look at the implicit bias. It doesn't mean that they should be terminated. It means that it has to be fixed. We have to look at all of those issues. And we have to look at them fairly. And we have to look at them without being derogatory or demeaning. We have to look at, at helping. And so if you can, you can change the culture simply by changing the teacher. You can change the culture by, by admitting that, you know what, we're going to address this mental health issue and we're going to do it and you're not going to lose your job. And we can change the culture simply by doing those, those health things. Because right now, as a police officer, we expect you to be tough. We expect you to do all of those things. You know what I tell our officers? I said, you know, I'm, I, I know you guys get a lot of accommodations. You get them, and we have these big ceremonies, and everybody's proud. You know, we have, we have police officers. You know, they can blindfold, and they can shoot with both hands and get 300, a perfect score. And we give, an, uh, give them an accommodation. And you wrote the most traffic tickets. We give you an accommodation. You made a great arrest, and we give you an accommodation. I'm like, why? That's your job. You're supposed to do that. If you want to impress me, tell me the names of the people that live on the block that you're patrolling in. Then I know you've engaged in community policing. You know the people on the block. And if you really want to impress me and get an accommodation, tell me the names of their pets. <laughs> Because now I know that you've had some conversation. You've engaged your community. That's how we change the culture. We have these expectations of our officers that are wrong. We have expectations of our police officers that we shouldn't have. We have to take some of that pressure off them. We have to ask them to be equitable. You have to eradicate all that social media that they do. I have a social media policy. If my officers say anything on a personal social media site, they're terminated. Because at 4 o'clock in the morning, you don't think anybody's reading that stuff. And you say whatever you want to say. And then in the sunshine, you said something that was inappropriate, something that was racist, sexist, something that you should not have said. I don't tolerate that. You can't have a negative attitude about African Americans and you say it on your social media and then I expect you to go down there and patrol in an African American community. It opens us up for lawsuits and it tells me that you got some other issues.
So you can't use racial epithets at the kitchen table, at home, when the public is not looking, and expect that I will respect you in your better moments when the public is looking. We just have to be consistent, whether we're at home or whether we are in the sunshine of the public. We have to be consistent. Not because it's the right thing to do. Not even because you think it's the wrong thing to do. But you have to do it so your kids will respect you at the end of the day. You have to do it so your kids will respect you. You can't say stuff in the car in front of your kids and use a racial epithet and then turn around and go outside and get out of the car and you're the nicest person in the world. Your kids are totally confused. Mom, Dad, you just said this. That's on us. That's on all of us. That's on our police officers. Once you lay the prescription and once you give the expectations, it's easy. It's easy. They'll adjust. And they'll change this police department. And they'll change the communities. And the next thing you know, the public will be telling you how much they love their police department. Because that's what we really want. They'll tell you how much they care about the police department. How much they respect the police department. We can get there. It's not as daunting as you might think it is you will get there just by doing other stuff. It's really not all about the police. It's about the other stuff. And so if you're focusing only on the police and changing the police, you're not going to get there. You got to do the other stuff, the mental health stuff, the bias stuff. You got to do all of that stuff. And then before you know it, the officers will start to tell you how much they appreciate you. You start to hear the stories about how they cried, how they couldn't handle a situation. They'll start to tell you the stories about how they're better people and how they are now de-escalating and how without putting themselves at risk, they had the ability to disarm somebody just by being kind, just by being kind. It goes back to this love thing. Um, I represent a city in Vermont with a growing but very small African American community. Um, two years ago, we hired our, our for two years ago we elected our first uh, African American woman to our city council. Last year, we hired an African American gentleman to be the superintendent of our schools. But they're really the only two minority public figures in my community. And so, what I would ask you in regards to advice is a community that has you know, a small number of African American, mainly children, teens, 20-somethings, and we want to include them in our community. We want them to feel empowered in our community. We want them to feel, you know, a legitimate part of our community, but we want them to be comfortable in their own skin, but when they look at city leaders, when they look at their teachers, when they look at our police force, you know, they don't see people who look like them. So my question will be, what can we do people like myself who don't know what it's like to spend a day in their skin, what can we do to include this small group in the entire fabric of our community? And thank you, I think that's a terrific question. Uh, it's just a matter of just being welcoming. Yeah, I mean, you have a very, very small percentage of, of folk. Just being welcoming and just really understanding uh, uh, or trying to understand uh, that there will be different struggles. And so, you know, an example of that is just being culturally competent, which, we, which may require you to do a little bit more work in terms of some African-American history. Uh, 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 you know, you can't, you, you, you should at least be cognizant of some of the things that are, that are going on. Uh, you're in a unique position because now you have to, you have to learn a bit about their struggles. Uh, um, uh, and a good example of that, uh, uh, I was the first year law student out of the public school setting, 
and, and had never been in this, this big white environment before in my life. And I thought that I was a smart kid and the whole nine yards. And the, and the, the, the fact situation, you know, the fact situation in law school uh, was about golfing. Golfing? I had no idea about golfing. And so the, the, the torch situation was, you know, the golf ball kept, kept, kept going over the fist and, and, and dinging somebody upside the head. You know, what was the, what was the cost avoidance of all of that? You know, I'm like, okay, golfing, ball hitting somebody upside the head, what do I do? I'm like, build a fence higher, <laughs> right? I'm, you know, because I'm thinking it's like baseball. First base is always down this line, third base is always to the left, the pitch is always in front of you. And the professor says, why didn't you just move the hole? Okay, that makes sense, but I didn't know you can move the hole in golf. Being culturally competent. And so, not asking kids to engage in something that is a cultural event. You can expect them to know that the square root of 2 is 1.414 and the square root of 3 is 1.73267. You can expect that because that's we expect that in math. But you can't expect me to know that the golf hole could be moved in such a way that it would not require me to hit the ball in that direction. And so cultural competency puts the onus on you as the leader to know a little something. And so when you're in the first grade classroom or you're in the fourth grade classroom or you're in the seventh grade classroom, always find something that the kids can identify with or a point or a fact that the kids can identify with because the kids will go home and they'll say, you know what, there was a representative at my school today and he was talking about Harriet Tubman or he was talking about this or he was talking about that. And you will have a voter and a supporter for the rest of your life because you did it with them. And they went home and they talked to mom and dad about what you said at their schools. Doing it from the bottom up not a lot of good thing happens from the top down. It's from the bottom up. If I want to sell a car now, I go and I talk to your kids about, you know what, your mom and dad really should buy this big old SUV. And the next thing you know, the kids are telling mom and dad, you really should buy a big old SUV. And they'll get angry and they'll keep telling mom and daddy, buy this car, buy this car, buy this car, before you know it, mom and dad, they bought that big old SUV. So. I think that's how you do this. You know, if you become culturally confident enough just to be able to talk to the kids, I don't think that you have to do anything that is over the top and be sincere about it. I think you'll find that that community will become so attached to you. Uh, that it's amazing because sometimes you won't find African American police officers. I'm having that problem in the city of St. Louis, being able to retain African-American police officers. Maybe you don't need an African-American police officer in this region, but what they do need is for you to represent all of them and be culturally competent. They have you, maybe that's all they need. Some folks, this wasn't their first choice, and others of us said, you're going to love judiciary. It's an amazing committee, and I think this is an excellent example of how the opportunities that, that we have, you Chief Justice, and, and really um, 
really brings out how fortunate we are to be here. Thank, thank you. So thank you, really Madam from, Chair. From thank you. Heart. Thank you so much. You know, and I can just really, just really feel the commitment, your commitment to this. So thank you so very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.